The Lewis Burke Frumkiss Center for Writing and Culture at Hunter College presents 10 Years of Best-Selling Authors and Great Thinkers. I'm Lewis Frumkiss, Director of the Writing Center. I'm glad you've all come, and I'm even more excited that we, I see a lot of faces I haven't seen before, which means that Pamela has a certain magnetism that uh, brings in new faces, which I like, and we are still expecting some, some more people. Um, as you know, this is part of our best-selling author series, and I just want to tell you that uh, we're about halfway through, and I think later on, um, um, Jeanette Watson is going to be coming here. She she wrote. She used to own Books and Company. If any of you remember it on Madison Avenue, great bookshop, and and she's written a memoir about her her very uh, storied life, which I think you will find absolutely fascinating. And then we have uh, Alex Valenkin, who, if you enjoyed um, if you enjoyed Paul uh, Paul Steinhardt last week, if you came to hear him, the cosmologist, Alex Vilenkin is also one of the world's great uh, cosmologists and has a slightly d different take than Paul, and, and you'll find him fascinating. And then, of course, um, Sandra Brown, who you've probably read, has had, you know, I don't know, 60, 100 books on the bestseller list over the years, and, and she's coming coming in to do the best-selling author, so he says, great. Then please remember that in, uh, in on, on June 15th, we're having our writers, uh, the we call it a summer symposium. It's a small version of what we used to call our writers' conference, and we have uh, some keynotes, such as Deborah Treisman, who's the fiction editor of the New Yorker magazine, and um, uh, David Steinberg, who works with Larry David and writes the Seinfeld show and is a, a comic, used to be on the Carson show, and he, he's wonderful. And Jeffrey Deaver, who, if you like thrillers as I do, writes some of the more intelligent uh, thrillers around. Um, that said, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, and after I introduce Pamela, we'll open it up to Q&A, and when we do that, Please, my assistant asked me to announce that please wait until she can get to you with a microphone. Uh, it's just helpful because sometimes your voices are not able to be heard by everyone else. Pamela Paul is one of the more interesting people you are likely to meet if you love books. Uh, that is because Pamela also loves books is unpretentiously erudite, and wrote My Life with Bob, about which she'll talk tonight, which is not about a lover or a husband or any other guy, but refers to her book of books, a record of every book she's read for the last 28 years, beginning with the trial, which she wrote about in a diary while she was away for a summer in rural France, uh, and obsessively continues, and which she con obsessively continues to do until today. And trust me, Pamela really reads the books. Um, no skimming for her, because as one person described her, she is besotted with them, reading them, holding them, talking about them, writing about them, and even writing her own. My Life with Bob is a love letter to books. In addition to it, she has written The Starter Marriage and the Future of Matrimony, Pornified, How Pornography is Transforming Our Lives, our relationships and our families, Parenting, Inc., and by the book, Writers on Literature and the Literary Life. I believe that's here also. Um, as if this were not enough, she also serves as the editor of the New York Times Book Review and is editor of book, all book coverage for the New York Times. Pamela has written columns in prestigious magazines and journals of opinion, been a correspondent, and appeared on TV and radio speaking about social and cultural issues, uh, literature, and publishing. Without uh, fully fleshing out the list 
of Pamela's extreme talents, I think you will understand why I was so delighted to invite her this evening as one of the speakers for the Hunter uh, College Writing Center's 2018 best-selling authors. Pamela? That was such a nice introduction, and I feel like it, it uh, gives me an excuse to be as tired as I am, if nothing else. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about my book, but I'm happy afterwards to answer questions about the New York Times book review and our books coverage and kind of anything else other than our political coverage. Um, I'm going to tell you a story um, that begins, as many so many stories do, with failure, um, and it like so many stories, has a happy ending. It'll just take me a while to get there. I'll start with the failure. So like many bookish little girls, I wanted to be a writer. I uh, did what an aspiring writer does when she's a little girl, which is that I decided to keep a diary. And I did this multiple times. I would very uh, deliberately set off to the local stationery store. I would buy a diary that had like a sparkly unicorn on the cover. I would set out very deliberately uh, to write my deepest uh, inner thoughts. Um, and then I would go back and read them, thinking that these would someday uh, be kept for posterity and be read by many people. And what happened when I went back and read those diaries is I realized they were terrible. Um, the content was uh, trivial and adolescent. Uh, they contained anecdotes like, um, Katie said that she could sleep over, that she couldn't sleep over my house, and then I found out that she was sleeping over at Ingrid's, um, and sort of furious scribblings about fights with my parents and friends. And not only was the content uh, dreary uh, and uh, trivial, the prose wasn't even good. There was no sign of Joe March in there. There wasn't any kind of indication of a budding Judy Bloom. So essentially, I was a failed teenage diarist. And it wasn't until I was 17, and um, as Lewis mentioned, I was living, spending a summer in France, which sounds, uh, Sounds very uh, luxurious, but in fact, for me, it was a huge disappointment at the time. I had never been abroad, and I went abroad with the American Field Service and was sent to a tiny little town called Mauriac, dans le Cantal, which is like a little teeny sort of farming département that I think was regulated out of existence with the last sort of uh, redrawing of France. It was sort of such a dead end little hamlet that French people, when they heard about it, were like, mais c'est où ça? Where, you know, what, what were you doing there? Um, it was essentially the middle of nowhere. And so I felt uh, really sort of um, cheated that I hadn't even gotten to see the Eiffel Tower, but instead had been sent to this tiny little village. And I was reading the trial, which to me um, is a kind of perfect metaphor for uh, adolescence in that, you know, Kay wakes up and uh, he is arrested for a crime. Everyone thinks that he's guilty for something, about something. Uh, he doesn't know what he's done wrong um, and he thinks that he's done nothing wrong, but maybe he's wrong about that. And that's kind of the way you feel as a teenager, that you're sort of being persecuted by the world and everyone is dead set against you. Um, but what I did when I finished the trial is I put the name of the author and the title in a new kind of diary which I call my book of books, or Bob. Um, and uh, that diary was the first really successful diary that I'd ever kept. Because rather than keep track of all of the kind of terrible things that I felt like were going on in my uh, really trivial, boring adolescence, um, this was a diary that kept track of where I wish I were, or where I really thought that I was while all that was going on. It was where I wanted to be as opposed to where I was physically. And it was often where I felt like I, I really was, my true self. It was in books. Um, so I'm going to fast forward from that anecdote, which took place in the summer of 1988, to 2012. I was working at the New York Times Book Review. I'll get back to how that trajectory happened later. And we were trying to come up with a way to do a profile in the book review that made sense for the book review. The New York Times runs many profiles in many sections of the paper, but how could we do something that would make sense for the book review? And I had this idea that you could tell the story of someone's life through the books that they read, that it tells something about you to know what books inspired someone when they were a child and who their heroines and heroes were and their favorite writers and the genres that they thought uh, were beneath them and um, all kinds of other sort of ways to see someone through this lens of books. 
And this became by the book, um, the column uh, that Lewis mentioned earlier, which was turned into that book. Um, and in order to explain this, which I, I wasn't sure if it was entirely clear, would be entirely clear to readers what that meant, I wrote an essay on the back page called, I think, My Life with Bob, um, in which I wrote about this diary, Bob, that I'd been keeping since I was 17. And uh, when it came time to illustrating it, it was actually kind of nerve wracking because I felt like the only thing that you could possibly do uh, to, to sort of show how it worked was to show a page from the book, which we scanned in um, and, and put in the New York Times. So if you can just kind of imagine, it's in this book now, taking the first page of your 17-year-old diary and putting it in the New York Times, and of course now it's on the internet, so it's there forever and here. Um, it's embarrassing, um, because it does start with things like Kafka's The Trial, and it, it has you know Conrad and Faulkner and James in it, but it also has things like um, a memoir by the roadie from The Doors. So it's, it's not all uh, highbrow. But what I wanted to show through this essay was what I wanted by the book to do, which is that in one way, by the book, and you can be kind of read it on two different levels. You can see it as a list of recommendations. I kind of think of it as like the red carpet, but for nerds, it's like instead of what are you wearing, it's what are you reading. Um, on the other, and I think deeper level, it really does give you an insight into the person's character. Do they really have all of those books on their newsstand, for example, or maybe they're exaggerating so ever so slightly, um, or trying to put on airs, um, and, or sometimes someone who you think of as you know, very highbrow and literary might confess to liking self-help. And so I think that you can tell a lot about people through what they're reading. So I guess it was now four years ago or three years ago, by the book turned out to be popular and successful. It's still running in the book review. And we decided to turn it into an anthology, the one over there. And after that came out, my editors asked me to lunch and said, OK, now it's time to do another book. What would you like to do? And I said, well, I, I would just like to do like volume two of that, um, because <clears throat> it's kind of hard to write a book while you have a full-time job. Uh, and they said, actually, what we were thinking of was that you would turn um, your essay, My Life with Bob, into a book. So there were a few problems with this. One is that that was not my idea of what I wanted to write, and I'd never written a book that wasn't my idea. Some writers, I think, are, are very good with sort of taking an assignment, ghost writers, for example, and kind of running with it. But for me, and I think for a lot of writers, you have to feel like something really comes from within to be inspired to spend a year or more working on it. And, and that's how I felt. And I also had a couple of other problems. One was I as I mentioned, had a full-time job. I have three full-time kids, so I hadn't, didn't have any time to write it. Um, and then thirdly, I thought, well, a book about a list of books would be really boring to read. Um, but I, I came up with solutions. I came up, um, the first solution I came up with after like carelessly agreeing to do this and signing the contract was, well, I'll write it on the train. Um, at this time, I was living in Harlem, and I had worked on a train before. I'd worked on the Acela, and for those of you who've worked on the Acela, you know, it's a really nice place to work. You go, you sit in the quiet car, you have the table in front of you, you set out all your things, and it's great. You get a lot done. Um, and that's what I kind of imagined uh, working on the train would be. I'd actually never been on Metro North. I didn't know that they didn't even have trays. Um, so that was a, a little bit of a rude awakening when I set out to have my sort of first day at work on the train. Um, but the reason I agreed to this was I, I kind of got back to the idea of what Bob was, that this wouldn't be a book about a list of books, and it wouldn't even be about the books themselves, because I didn't want to write a work of literary criticism and book reviewing as sort of what I, I'm in all day long. What I wanted to write a book about was the relationship between the book and the reader. I wanted to write about that space in between. I wanted to write about what my Bob meant to me, which is a diary that really does tell the story of my life. When I look at that trajectory, I don't necessarily remember the content of all the books. I don't remember the names of the characters. I don't remember the arguments. I don't remember you know, the particular views of history that a historian might have. But what I do remember is where I was when I read that. And I remember what I thought of it. And I remember where I bought, bought it or who gave it to me. I remember what the cover looked like. And I can remember when I look at the sequence, sort of what led me to then pick up the next book, whether it was to escape from the previous book or to continue thinking about a subject. And I thought, you know, this is really, it tells me a trajectory of my life. You know, in the same way that 
any of you, if you go on vacation, you often really remember what you read on the beach that time. If you look at a book, you can often place it um, at a distinct time of your life and a place uh, where you remember reading it. And I felt that way about this trajectory. So I set up this idea of what this book would look like. Um, and much of it sort of followed rules that only I would know and that no reader could possibly discern, but made sense to me as a way to frame it. So I thought I will take a book that's in my life, in my actual book of books, and I named each chapter after one of those books. But rather than focus on the book itself, I would pull out some theme about how books function in relationship to the reader um, and talk about how it worked not only in my life, but also how these things operate in many people's lives. So for example, a book about um, the, a chapter that is called um, Swimming to Cambodia, which is named after Spalding Gray's memoirs about narrators. Um, and during that particular period in my life, I was traveling a lot. And so that I was actually in Cambodia when I read it. Um, and it's sort of about the way in which travel writing and narrators' voices can kind of inhabit your own mind and in inflect your own thinking. Um, the idea was that if I looked at the space between a book and a reader, I would get at something that felt more universal than my own life. In fact, I didn't intend for this to be a memoir. It was a little bit startling to me when it was announced as a memoir um, because I, I, I'm slightly adverse to writing about myself personally. Um, and so that, to me, again, made it feel more about the process of reading, not only for me, um, but for everyone. It's about the idea that who you are and where you are in your life affects how a book will affect you. So you might be, for example, a 53-year-old housewife in Iowa, and you could have a 16-year-old schoolgirl in Nigeria, and they might both be reading, say, Catherine Booth's Behind the Beautiful Forevers about poverty in India. And they're both going to be reading the same story, but they're both going to be reading that. They're each going to be reading that in a very different way, because we all bring to every book our own life experiences and our own perspectives. And I think that even the same person, depending on where you are in your life, can bring a different point of view to a single book. And my favorite example of that is Anna Karenina. I think that if you read Anna Karenina, let's say when you're 19 and you're single, and you read it and you think this is so romantic, you know, she just she had to leave um, her husband to be with Vronsky. They're destined to be together. And then if you read that book again, let's say, and you're married and you have a small child, you read it and you think this is terrible. She abandoned her child. How could she do that? And then you might read it again when you're, I don't know, in your 50s and think, you know what, I kind of understand this. It seems a little bit more, you might be more forgiving. And so the ways, where we are in our life and who we are affects how we read a book. And I think every author has had the experience of going out on book tour and meeting a reader. And the reader might say something like, I loved your book. I love the fact that it was about revenge. And the author might think to themselves, that's, I don't, I wrote a book about redemption, not revenge. Because, you know, each of us, we read books in a way that, that isn't necessarily what the author intends. And obviously, the fact that we react so differently to books is, is part of what I do during the day at my day job at the book review, because we can have one book reviewed by two very different critics and have very different judgments on those two books. So I thought that by looking at these questions, I could also get at other things that have intrigued me, and I think other readers, um, obsessive readers especially, about, about books and about the experience of reading, about whether there are things, there are books that one should read, um, about whether there is such a thing as a guilty pleasure or whether you should never feel guilty about what you read. I wanted to write about what does it mean to be a well-read person, um, and, and can you ever be well read? Is there a right way to read a book? Can a book improve you? Can books offer comfort or should books make you feel uncomfortable? And I thought about what it means to read not only alone but also socially and for me um, that experience has been, uh, I've, I've had that not only through my, my, my day job but also in a book club. And this one incident in, in my book club that happened about eight years ago has stuck with me, and it was something I, I also wanted to explore in this book, which is 
this happened, the, the book club that I'm in is a book club that only reads children's books, um, and uh, which I like because they're short and they're easy. And it means that I can read other things uh, for myself. And one, one interesting thing about this book club is that everyone who is in this book club, almost everyone works in the industry. So there are a couple of major publishers in the book club, editors, agents, authors. Not everyone has kids. Not everyone um, is even like a kidlet or was a kid-lit person before they entered this book club. But everyone takes the books very seriously. And so we were in a book club having dinner one night, and everyone was arguing very intensely over this YA novel. And people were really of sort of two minds. Some people hated it, and others loved it. And as people were debating, one of the members interrupted and asked a question. Um, she's a child psychiatrist, one of the sort of few non-literary world people in the club. And the question kind of stopped all of us in our tracks. And it was a really basic question. She said, well, you know, the way that you're reacting to this book, I think it depends on, you know, why, why you read. And so she said to everyone, why do you read? And it's such a basic question. And you would think that given the fact that we all work in the book world, that we would have known right away what the answer was. And yet everyone was kind of flummoxed, you know, and people like took some time and thought about it. And when, then we went around the table and people answered and everyone had different answers. You know, one person said, I, I, I read to learn something about the world that I don't already know. Um, another person said, I read to challenge myself. And then there were some more nuanced answers. Like some people said, one person said, you know, I used to read um, to challenge myself, but after my mother's death, I read only for comfort. I don't want to challenge myself um, anymore. And I thought about what my answer would be, and I realized my answer, although it shifts over time, and I think all of us probably read at different times for each of those reasons, but if I had to think of kind of the one underlying force for myself, it's reading to be transported. I read to be, to be in a world, to learn something, to have an experience that I would not otherwise have. And that can mean many things. That could mean reading Zola Germinal because I will never be a minor in 19th century France or reading a fantasy novel because I can never live on you know, a purple planet called Zorg. Um, and, and it's about getting out of my own sort of experience and doing, being somewhere else, which again, I think goes back to the idea of why I started keeping this book in the first place. And one of the questions I wanted to address in the, in the book, which I do from a very personal, in a personal way, is a question that I think a lot of us who work in books get asked, which is like, is there one book that changed your life? And for me, there is one book um, that changed my life. There's actually probably more than one, but there's one that I think um, is a very, offers a very clear example of that. And that book is called A Journey of One's Own. Um, the subtitle, I think, is Uncommon Thoughts for the Independent Woman Traveler. It's by a woman named Thalia Zapatos, and it came out in 1991. And that book had a huge effect on me. Um, and to kind of explain why, I have to go back to where I was when I read it in 1993. I was a senior in college. I had gone to college thinking that I would do one of two things when I graduated. I would I wanted to be a writer, but I would, that was too terrifying to even contemplate as something that one would do, and I needed to support myself. And as probably many of you know all too well, it's very hard to do that as a writer. So that was off the table. That was something I would do on the sly, like my diary or my book of books. So I thought I would do things that were writing adjacent. I would either go into publishing, which is what you, many people who want to be writers secretly or not so secretly do. Um, and the second was that I would be, I would go into advertising. My mother was an advertising copywriter. She entered the New York advertising world the same year that Peggy did, did in, uh, in Mad Men. Um, and I was kind of enchanted by what she did as a copywriter because she would come home from work and she would have assignments. And I remember she would like had an assignment from Chiquita Banana. And she would come up with like 20 slogans or taglines in like 10 minutes, you know. It's banana appeal and all of these sort of witty, punny things. And I thought I could do that. Um, so I went to college thinking I wanted to do those two things. And four years later, there I was in the career service office, and I was trying to do those two things. And so part of me felt a little uncomfortable with that. And, um, and I'll get to Thalia Zapatos and how her book worked in. Because I thought, 
I've been to college for four years, and if I learned so much about the world in college and I still want to do the same two things that I wanted to do going in, um, maybe I didn't get exposed to enough. Maybe I didn't learn everything that there is to know. And I realized this in the middle of a job interview. And what I was saying in the job interview when I realized this, I was sitting opposite the interviewer and I was saying, I really like Captain Crunch, but only when there are crunch berries. Like I feel like you need the tartness of the crunch berries to offset the sort of overwhelming sweetness of the main cereal. And um, the interviewer interrupted me at this point. And it was one of those situations where, you know, you sort of are, have this outer body experience, you have this kind of bird's eye view and you're looking at yourself from outside your body and you're like, what are you talking about? Like, what is it that you're saying? And the interview clearly agreed with my assessment because he interrupted and he said, you know, Many of us here at Quaker Oats like Captain Crunch too, but really why do you want to work at Quaker Oats? And uh, that was my answer, which I realized was not a good answer. And, and, and asked again, I, I, I realized I didn't want to work at Quaker Oats. And so I said, you know, you're right. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to work at Quaker Oats and I'm sorry to have wasted your time. And I got up and I left the interview room and I canceled all of my interviews um, that I had lined up on the schedule for the, at the career services. And I went down um, Thayer Street, this is in Providence at Brown, and I went to a bookstore that alas doesn't exist anymore, College Hill Bookstore, and I picked up A Journey of One's Own, which was one of those books, I didn't have a lot of money that I'd been sort of lightly flirting with. You know, I would go in, I would like read it a little bit and then put it back down, and I bought it. Um, and the reason that that book had interested me and the reason I immediately went to it is that Thalia Zapatos was one of these incredibly intrepid, adventurous women who, you know, like, I don't know, tubed down the Ganges and, you know, rode a camel across the Sahara. She had done all these incredible, adventurous things, things that I would never do, things that I never wanted to do, things that I was like, I would hate doing that. And so, Therefore, it kind of attracted me, and I thought, well, I, why do I resist this so much? Um, and so on the one hand, I had this like very predictable, these two things that I thought I wanted to do my whole life, and four years later, of, after college and this supposed you know, exposure to the world, I still wanted to do, and on the other hand, this other existence that seemed so incredibly foreign to me. And I thought, maybe I've only, I'm picking these two same things after four years because I've only been exposed to A through D in terms of my options. And I don't even know what E through Z is or I've assumed that those options weren't for me or that I couldn't do them. And I made a decision um, then and there that I would deliberately, instead of doing what I thought I wanted to do, do something that I thought I didn't want to do. I would do something like Thalia Zapatos. And I would, instead of taking a very predictable job in New York or Chicago in advertising or publishing, that I would do something that uh, would challenge everything that I normally would do in the course of the day. And I set out these rules for myself that I would do some, I would, I would go somewhere where every single part of my normal day couldn't be done. I couldn't wake up and have coffee and read the New York Times because. I was a New York Times person for a long time. I couldn't go about any of the things that I normally would in the course of my day. I wanted to go somewhere that I didn't want to go. Um, and so for me, that meant Asia. I grew up in a very Eurocentric um, uh, sort of frame of mind. I'd been traveled all over Europe, but I'd never been to Asia, and I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go because in Girl Scouts in second grade, we'd done a field trip <clears throat> to Benihana and I had eaten, I can't tell you how many of those seaweed covered crackers and then I threw up everywhere. And that for me, I was done with Asia after that. So, so I thought I should go to Asia, I should go to Asia, I should go somewhere where I know no one, where I have no job, where I have no connections, where it's not my religion and it's not my ethnicity and I don't know the language and I I'm starting completely from scratch and that every single moment of my day would challenge all of the assumptions that had gotten me up to that terrible Captain Crunch interview with Quaker Oats. Um, and so I, I bought a one-way ticket to Northern Thailand. I didn't want to live in a major international city, which would be too much like living in New York City. And I moved to um, a then rather small city in the north of Thailand called Chiang Mai um, with no job and no contacts and nothing. Um, 
And it was a really, I mean, that, that experience changed my life in many, many ways, and some of it is in this book. But I think the sort of fundamental long-term way in which it changed my life is something, is in a way that I should have known as an avid reader. Because up to that point, I had thought that your life proceeded in a very regular, linear way. I had thought that I would, you know, go to school and I would get straight A's and I would calculate my GPA out to like the thousandth percentile and I would get into the Ivy League college early and then I would, you know, get all A's and I would graduate with honors and then I would get an apartment, I'd get a starter job, I'd get a cat, I'd get a boyfriend, I'd get a promotion and then a promotion and then we would get engaged and we would get married, we'd have one kid, two kids, three kids and then I would get promoted again and then I would die. And like that's how I thought it would go. I thought it was very linear and direct and I was on that path. Um, and of course I realized you know, after getting off the path, um, that that's not the way things go. And I should have known that from novels where there are plot twists and character development and things take unexpected turns. But it wasn't until I'd sort of thrown myself into that kind of unpredictable experience and, and, and went through it myself that I, that I had that realization. Um, and that realization then enabled me to go off the path again. Um, and in an odd way, it ended up leading me to writing um, because after I got back from Thailand, um, it, I, it's funny, before I went I thought, well, I thought life was like Candyland and I was like, I'll get there, I'll, I'll go there and I'll spend however long I spend there and when I get back, I'll be like a few steps like squares behind everyone else, but I'll catch up probably, or I'll just like be a few steps behind everyone else for the rest of my life. And I didn't realize, of course, that life is more like shoots and ladders and you, you, know, you have your, your setbacks. And when I got back, of course, I ended up working in publishing, and it was fine. I wasn't behind that whole idea. You know, I dis it disabused me of that notion very quickly. But three years later, when I had another opportunity to sort of step off the path, um, I was working. I had just taken a job at Time Inc. I'd only been there for three months, and the kind of person I'd been up to, you know, my life up to when I gone to Thailand would never have quit a job after three months but what happened was I met someone and we got engaged and he got into uh, grad school in London and he said let's go to London and quit your job and get rid of your apartment and do something about those two cats and go and I said okay um, and I never would have said okay I don't think if I hadn't gone to Thailand and been abroad and realized it all works out when you come back um, and when I got to London um, it I didn't have working papers, I couldn't get a job, but what I did do was um, meet up with someone who was an editor at The Economist, who put me in touch with another editor there, and I ended up getting my own column in The Economist, which I then wrote for the next six years, and it was the first time that I'd ever written in anything other than my book of books, or you know, private kind of letters and scribblings, and that was how I got my start as a writer. And I don't think that would have happened, frankly, had I not read A Journey of One's Own and had I not made that leap. Um, so I promised a happy ending. I want to just, I'm going to read a teeny weeny thing from the book so that you'll understand why this ending was so happy for me. Um, so I grew up in a very book deprived environment. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. My mother never bought books. My allowance at the time was 10 cents a week, and that was cheap even in the 70s. Um, so if I, if I ever had enough money for books, it was essentially for two things. One was there was a dollar store called McCrory's, and I could go there, and like for $1.99, you could buy these books on newsprint like called 1001 Wacky Facts, and I could get that. Or I could get a used Nancy Drew um, from the used bookstore in town, and those were both great things. I'm not denigrating them. Um, but if I ever wanted to buy a book, my mother's response was get it from the library. There wasn't much you could say back to that. Our house, a creaking hulk built in 1673, had actually been our town's first library. It had long ceased to serve in that capacity, but we were just around the corner from the existing library, which was directly across from Main Street School. After dismissal, I'd cross the street and install myself for an hour or two. While the library was, of course, a public institution, it felt private to me. The children's libraries were mine. I knew where my friends Ginny and Geneva waited and where the slightly naughtier clicked cat gang hung out at the end of the front row. The mean kids from Deany and Blubber looked down from the high shelf. These characters provided my social life and I never had to be told to be quiet in their presence. I wanted to crawl into the stacks and absorb the musty smell of decades old paper. 
I rifled my fingers through the wooden card catalog drawers like they were flip books, trying to decode them. I could be the first girl to master the Dewey Decimal System. I might one day know where every book stood. All I needed was some kind of authority, or at least some officially sanctioned status. A few years after we moved to town, I mustered the courage to ask for a job. I'm sorry, there are no jobs available for children, the librarian told me. I was 10. You wouldn't have to pay me, I insisted, my eyes gleaming with what surely came across as unhealthy fervor. That's okay, thank you. The rejection was terrible. What was it that put the children's librarian off my candidacy? Was it the you don't have to pay me part? Did she question my motives? Did she not see that I was a book person different from other more casual library visitors? That I would never leave a book face down with its spine splayed open like other kids my age? I couldn't help but feel they were taking me down a notch. This library isn't yours, you know, is how I heard it. Every once in a while, I'd gin up the pluck to inquire again, thinking maybe they wouldn't remember me from the last time. Sometimes asking at the children's library, other times going to the person at checkout with the enviable task of scanning each book through the ghostly red glow of the primitive computer system. These requests were always swiftly rebuffed, and each time I felt sorry for having had the temerity to ask. This um, section I just read is part of a chapter called Catch-22 about sort of the more you read, the more you realize you haven't read enough, and the greater your desire for books, sort of, and the more you collect them, the more you realize you still have holes in your collection. And from this um, failed attempt to get a job at the library, I've actually gone back and I've read at this library now, I've spoken there three times, and they've apologized. Um, <laughs> they, re they regret it. Um, but anyway, I, I, I then, I, I really tried to get to the books, and I, I ended up getting a job at B. Dalton um, at the Americana Shopping Center on Long Island, which was like a life goal, it was like a grand achievement, but at that time they only gave employees a 5% discount on books. It's really cheap. Apparently it's not that bad in most bookstores for employees these days, but for, for me it was brutal and, and a hardcover was, was hard to affo afford. Um, so the very happy ending, um, which believe it or not, I can still, you can trace back to, the, uh, to a journey of one's own, a little bit through The Economist and sort of where that led me subsequently. The happy ending is where I am now, frankly, which is at the New York Times Book Review, which is um, a really great job in many, many ways. Um, but I have to say the fact that I can get all the books that I want now is a big part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Pamela, for a, a marvelous talk. And now, Pamela will answer some questions. And please wait, when I call on you, please wait until they bring the mic to you. Let's start in the back with the lady in the very rear green vest. I can call on people if you want. What? I can call on people okay. if you want, yeah. Hi, thank you, that was fabulous. Oh, um, my question is, when you went to Thailand, did you plan how long you would go for? No. And did you stay that length of time? I how? stayed for almost a year. I would have probably, I actually would have stayed for longer. Um, what ended up happening was that I, if, in order to stay longer in the job that I had, I needed to commit. I ended up working, teaching history at a local school and also actually being the librarian. That's another <laughs> little bit of revenge. Um, and, uh, but they needed me to commit to a two-year contract and I didn't want to do that. Um, and so I decided at that point that I would move to Hong Kong. Um, and um, before I decided I would move to Hong Kong, this was before the changeover from when the British chain, you know, um, uh, gave it back uh, to China. Um, I traveled for six weeks in, in China by myself on like a really brutal budget of $15 a day, um, which meant that I was often kind of sleeping on cement and it was, it was just not an easy trip. And so at the end of that trip, I thought I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna just like relax for a week or two and I'm gonna go, because this was before the internet um, or like the internet uh, for regular people. And uh, I'm gonna drive up to Providence, go to that career services thing and find out the names of some contacts in Hong Kong because I knew that unlike Thailand, where you could kind of go for a year, you know, without any money, um, that the rent would be much higher in Hong Kong, and then I would really have to get a real job. So I wanted to go up there and get some contact information. And when I was up there, uh, a, a job came through the fax machine. <laughs> this is yielding days. While I was standing there, and the job that came through on that slimy fax paper was for a job at Scholastic. And I thought, hmm. 
if I were going to stay in New York instead of go to Hong Kong, this is like the kind of thing that I would do. So I, I don't know, accidentally really three weeks later I was working at Scholastic and that ended my return to Asia. Um, in, the, in the beige sweater. Ms. Paul, how do books play a role in your children's lives? That's a good question because it's, I'm actually very foolishly, when I finished writing a book on the train, I felt like I just, like everything opened up. I was able to read again on the train. It was my own time. I could even look out the window and I swore I would never write another book on the train again. And I am actually, like three months later, I signed another contract to write a book on the train and that book is called How to Raise a Reader, um, which is exactly about that because it's something that I feel um, really strongly about. So, I mean, if you ask, I have a lot of thoughts about it. I have an entire book, um, which I'm co-writing with my children's book editor. Um, but for me, uh, you know, there's one very basic thing, and it's an answer that nobody really wants to enact, and I realize it's like a huge request for most people, but I do it in my own life, um, and uh, what I do is I deprive my children of all other um, opportunities and options, which is to say we don't have TV, we don't have video games, they don't have tablets or e-readers or computers or phones, um, and so they have no choice. Um, but, uh, but I do that because I think that you become a reader at a very, I mean, you people come to books later, and it does happen, absolutely. Um, but I do think that, um, especially now, I think people are seeing that their attention can be easily diverted by all of these other competing forms of, of media, and you, you're, it, it, it happens remarkably quickly. I mean, I know people who are readers for life, and yet they feel like it's very hard to sustain their attention, you know, to have a sustained attention to a novel, like especially if their phone is nearby, clicking and, and beeping. Um, and so I wanted my kids during those formative years not to, not to become accustomed to long form narrative, because I think that if you are exposed to it early on, you build a desire for it. Um, and, and a habit, and it, it, I think that even for those of us who are distracted by our phones, if you are a reader at heart, at a certain point you feel deprived if you're not reading books, and if you're not putting that phone away and those other things away, and, and, and sinking and immersing yourself into a book. So I wanted to have them um, develop that habit very early on. And the other thing, and they got also this is very lucky for me, and this is, you know, it, it's sort of the, the cliche of, of parenthood, which is you do the exact opposite of your parents. Um, and so because I was so book deprived, I do the opposite with my kids, and they have like pretty much every book that they want. Um, sometimes it's from the library, uh, but a lot of the times, um, and again, I'm, I'm lucky because of my job that I can get books for them. They have a huge amount of books, and we keep them all over the house. And I... The, the reason for that is that I feel like if you, you can never say I'm bored if there's a book nearby. Um, and so I try to keep them kind of constantly exposed to a wide range of books. Um, yeah, in the blue. Um, how would you characterize a book review? Is it an analysis? It is, is it a substitute for the book? Uh, is it a promotional piece? Um, it's definitely not a promotional piece. That's the easiest thing. Um, I think that a book review serves different functions for different readers. And I think that for many people, they do want to read about the book so that they don't have to read the book itself or so that they know that they don't want to read the book itself, but they want to read all of the juicy bits. Um, and so I think that you can have a review that, that serves that function. But ultimately, I think, and, and you can talk about the differences between a straight book review and, and literary criticism. And you know, we, we, are, we at the New York Times are a newspaper. So we are serving a newspaper audience and we're serving readers of the New York Times. Um, and that means, you know, we're not the same as a literary journal or as an academic journal. And so we, ha we, ha we, we kind of function within the realm of journalism. And so because of that, we want to tell people sort of, you know, deliver on what, what new book is important and why. Why are we reviewing this book? Give a sense of what's in the book and offer some kind of assessment and judgment. I mean, I really personally can't stand a book review where you read it and at the end of it, you're like, I don't... Did, do they like the book? You know, I, I, don't, I can't tell. So I really feel like you need to have, you need to, the, the person needs to weigh in and ideally engage with the work intellectually, emotionally, um, on, on, on some level so that you feel like there's sort of something at stake there. 
And you know, there, there are many kind of other elements of a, of a book review about what makes a good book review and what makes a bad book review. And by that, I don't mean a positive book review or a negative, but a well done book review. Um, you, we get, and it's easier to talk about a bad book review than a good book review. I mean, there are many book reviews that come in and, and, and they don't quote from the work itself. So you need to give a sense of the writing. Um, I, I think that a good book review offers some kind of context. Who is this person? Especially, you know, whether it's nonfiction or fiction, but especially with nonfiction, you know, why did this person write this book? What kind of research did they do? What kind of access did they have? What do previous books on this subject say? What is this person's expertise? What is this person bringing to it? What is their argument? Are they persuasive in making their argument? And in what ways do they succeed in their goal? And in what ways do they fail? Um, there are, you know, and again, it, as I said, it's, it's easier to talk about bad book reviews than good ones, but it, some examples of some bad book reviews are book reviews that are more op-eds than books, where they sort of use the book as a platform um, to make a larger point about something that they're angry at um, or are angry about or upset over, um, or book reviews that review the book that they wish the author had written rather than the book that the author actually wrote. Um, I'm sure you, it sounds like you're all familiar with some of these uh, art forms, um, if you can call them that. Um, so I, you know, and I also think that a book review should be an engaging piece of writing in and of itself. But I feel like I want people to come to the book review. We're not simply a service. We're not here necessarily just to tell you, like, read this or read that, but also to be read for our own sake. So, you know, for me, a really good book review is like any good form of writing, good piece of writing. It's informative and it's entertaining and it's well written and it's, you know, surprises you and it gives you, you know, something to think about. In the stripes. Uh, I just wanted to ask you when uh, you finally decided to write your first book, did you just, although you were already a writer, did you just, or a columnist, did you just delve in and write a book or did you take a creative writing course or did you, you know, did you have enough chutzpah to just go out and write your own book or did you? <laughs> um, so I, I wrote my first book because something really terrible happened, which is that the person that I ran away with to London um, divorced me. <laughs> and and uh, what happened was in my, you know, after like weeping and, and, and wallowing in pity for a while, I realized I wasn't the only one this had happened to and that there was sort of, um, I, I then, you know, my sort of repertorial skills kicked in and I realized there was something larger going on. And um, it was in conversation with a friend who was an editor, but ultimately not the editor of my book. Um, and at that point, I think it was an editorial assistant anyway, um, that I thought that there could be a book in there. Um, and I was lucky because I had an agent. And again, I, you know, all things kind of go back to a journey of one's own. I had an agent that I had gotten while I was right back after I got back from Thailand. And I had gotten that agent because while I was in Thailand, I wrote these letters that I called pamograms. And because I was inherently lazy, I would send one to my mom and she would photocopy it like 40 times and then distribute it to a list of people so I didn't have to constantly write letters. And also because I was really started to kind of narrate what was going on in my life while I was living in Thailand. And um, these letters then circulated, again, all pre-internet. And one of the people who um, heard them was an, an editor. And she said she should, she should write. And so she then introduced me to an agent. So I had an agent already. So that's how that first book happened. Yeah. So she asked how you go about getting an agent, which is not easy. Um, and um, so I should say that I, I, I can never give individualized advice to uh, getting a book published because of the rules around my job at the New York Times. But, um, and back in the day when I was able to give advice, it was very different because there was a book of agents. Um, and so the very generic advice I give is to figure out books that are similar, for someone to figure out books that are similar to the ones that one wants to write, and then to look at the acknowledgments where people acknowledge their agents, and then to look up that agent, and some agents accept unsolicited manuscripts and others don't, and you kind of get started that way. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Before I announce that we'll take three more questions, um, and then Pamela will be good enough to send 
sit over here and inscribe books for anyone who wants them. I should mention to this young lady that at the writer's uh, seminar this summer on June 15th, we have a panel of agents who will explain that and you can actually sample them, meet them, see what they're like and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's much more helpful. Yes. Do you ever read on a Kindle? And if so, how does it change the reading experience? So I don't personally um, because I, I love physical books. I love them so much that I will often have multiple copies of the same book because I like like the cover or the way that it's set or the paper. Or I like to have like a UK edition and a US edition, but also for really simple sort of tactile reasons. Um, one of which is like, I don't want to know what percent I'm done in a book. Like I want to be able to, I want to go like this and be like, I'm almost there, you know, but, and then be like, no, but this is the index, so actually, um, you know, and be able to flip back and forth and find my way, and um, so I really, I, I, I like this format. I actually don't feel like this technology can be improved upon, or at least, you know, not until the day that you get to some kind of magical thing where you can actually dive in and, and be inside the book. Yes? Besides uh, Kindles and besides phones, how have books and reading changed in your time period? In oh my God, that's a yeah. huge, in my time period, well, I'm terribly young, so nothing has changed. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, at the book review. I mean, for me at the book review, I can, I, let me answer it this way, which is maybe not exactly what you asked, but what we do at the book review has changed dramatically from the time when I joined it, which was in 2011 until now. It's, it's like night and day. And um, I hope or imagine that some of you are longtime readers of the book review. And if I say that, you know, my predecessor was Sam Tannenhaus and before him was Chip McGrath, you might be familiar with some of these names. Um, that their job was quite different because what they uh, were able to sort of do with their day was was really get into the books and think about well you know what should we be reviewing and who should review it and 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 editing them and 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 I imagine them you know leaning back and thinking long deep thoughts about books and and I like to do that but that's about 50 percent of what we do because we're thinking about this in a, in a digital era and um, we have to think not not you know we, it's we're no longer in an era where you can just kind of sit back and assume everyone's going to get their New York Times delivered to their front door and that it's all going to be presented in that way but you have to really think about some people are going to be reading this on their phone and other people are going to read it on a Kindle and some people are just going to see something posted on Facebook and others are going to subscribe to a newsletter and some are going to get it in print and some of them are going to only see it on a calendar app and some of it are going to only hear my podcast and what should that look like and who should get what and how should it be, pre be presented. So we've become, I think, like many you know, news organizations and media organizations, much more um, attentive to who the reader is, where the reader is, what works best for that particular reader. And so it's, you know, it, it's no longer, you know, uh, this is what we're doing and then we dump it all in the book review and, and there it is. It's doing that like, but times 10. Yes. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just choosing the person furthest away from you to make you walk around. How does the Times decide what books to review? Um, well, that makes it sound very grand that it's the Times, but it's me and a team of editors. And um, and I would say, so to answer, like very without getting too deep in the weeds, there are two different ways that we review books in the New York Times. Um, and these used to be two, part of two separate uh, divisions or departments at the Times, and now they're all under one centralized department. So the critics of the Times, who are currently Dwight Garner, Paul Siegel, and Jennifer Salai. Um, you may remember, for example, Michiko Kakutani, who was our critic for 35 years until last year. Um, those critics determine what they are going to review. And they make that decision, I would say, based on three things. Um, in general, although <laughs> many other little things. One is, is this a book that I think is valuable? Is this something that I have something to say, something to say about? Is this a book that I feel like I can engage with? Um, is this also a book that I think is important for the New York Times to weigh in on as an institution? Because as the staff critics of the New York Times, they're representing not only their own tastes and their own um, sort of perspectives, but also they're representing the Times as an institution. Is this a book that the 
Times ought to review. And so that's the way they think about it, and they're making that determination in conjunction with their editor. Um, for the book review, it's a little bit different. So they, there you start with the critic, and the critic determines the book. At the book review, the editors of the book review make that determination, and they are divided into various areas of expertise, um, although there's a lot of crossover. Um, and some do fiction and nonfiction, and some do particular areas of each. Um, and so they're deciding, is this a book that we think that we should review? And if so, who would we most want to hear? on this book, who ideally of all the people out there, generally, um, well, always outside the Times critics. It's not the Times critics who weigh in in the book review, but in the world of criticism, in academia, in the arts, in public life, who would we most want to hear on this book? Um, and so, uh, and it, we also do take into account, um, you know, what we think Times readers should be reading. But we also, and I think the critics do this as well, is we're all trying to, you know, we don't just want to review the books that everyone thinks we're going to review. I think everyone uh, who works in books at the Times is also thinking that part of our role is to recognize new voices and to elevate them and to bring them to people's attention and to write about the undiscovered books and, and the sort of less publicized ones and books from smaller publishers. And that what, that's what really excites us, I have to say, that when you find something that feels like a discovery and that you feel like you can help bring it out into the world. That's the last question? Okay. Um, you have a lot of books and your children have a lot of books. Where do you put all these books? <laughs> um, it's like a constant ongoing like excavation project in my house of building new shelves, but I also weed them out a lot. Um, and I used to be like a, uh, a really um, diehard keeper of books, um, and I've now become, uh, I eliminate books. Um, and I have sort of certain ways that I do that. With my kids' books, it's the easiest because those go to libraries and to schools um, locally. And, uh, you know, then we have like a whole, I have a big family, so there's like a reserve of like cousins that they get filtered down into. And part of what I think helps engage my children in books generally is that they like to think about who would best, who would most want this book. Um, and one of my kids, my, my middle child who is 11, he has become very close to the librarian at his school and so he takes it upon himself to determine um, what the library is missing and what he, he volunteers in the school library and so he, he, he'll be like, dog man, there are lots of second graders who want that, that, <laughs> you know, we need to give that to the library. Um, so uh, basically the it's a long answer. <laughs> That's I don't keep them all, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much. Pamela, that was a fascinating talk, a wonderful talk. I'm sure you all loved it. We do have some refreshments back there that you can in enjoy. And for those of you who would like to purchase a book, Pamela has to leave soon. So do it. Come up, and she'll be happy to inscribe one to you. And thank you for coming. <laughs>